Behind me is the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit, also known by everyone as the Stealth Bomber. Now this aircraft is still in active military service and there is only one on display anywhere in the world and it's right behind me. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, it's there. It's, um, it's a bit hard to see because of the whole stealth thing. And in this video, I'm gonna take you on a detailed tour and stop making bad jokes. I make videos about planes and some rockets. If you're into videos flying around the world and crawling through historical aircraft in museums, then check out my channel. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Now, a lot of the technology used in this aircraft is still classified, and what I'm going to tell you today is what I could find online and legally. The first thing that stands out when you meet this aircraft in the metal is how large it is. I'm not sure why, but I just pictured it as something a lot smaller. It weighs just under 72 tonnes empty and has a wingspan of 52 metres. Now this is the next generation of stealth after the F-117 Nighthawk as it was based heavily on the faceted design where the whole exterior is covered with small angular surfaces designed to scatter radio waves. But with the B-2 development they were able to simulate radar return on more complex curved surfaces with newer supercomputers. The B-2 has many curved and rounded surfaces that deflect radar beams and this design is known as continuous curvature. What is really striking other than the size is how smooth everything is. This is footage of a pitot tube on a YF-23 prototype, and aircraft use this to calculate their speed. Even something as small as this will completely destroy the B-2's low observability, so these here are actually sensors that would otherwise calculate the airspeed, angle of attack, etc. When I climb up on a ladder, you can see more of these sensors just in front of the windscreen. Now, I will come back to this view later, although let's continue to walk around. Now, I've tried to film this in a single sweeping shot to try and give you some perspective of how large this big bird is. We've got the forward landing gear down here, and you'll notice that the covering is angular. Now, any breaks between panels underneath is a threat to low observability, so any gap that can't be covered is angular in an attempt to deflect radar waves off in any direction other than the receiver. Now this actual aircraft was designed for fatigue testing and never flew itself. Engineers attached hydraulic plates along the airframe to simulate different stresses in the calculated that should be able to survive 150% of the designed pressure, but it wasn't until 161% that it finally cracked and this is where the crack happened. Now my apologies that my footage is a little splotchy as the light conditions weren't great for filming. As we walk along the wing's leading edge, and you'll notice that there's no leading edge slats, as the massive wing, which essentially includes the whole aircraft, generates enough lift anyway. Eventually, we reach the end of the wing, and you'll notice that there are no winglets. That's because any vertical structure would reflect radar waves, which is why there is no horizontal stabilizer or rudder at the rear. It would have also had a considerable radar cross section, and while the F-117 did have these, it was a smaller plane and radar technology has improved dramatically in recent decades. This raises the next interesting question, how do you control yaw? Engineers placed split rudders on the outer trailing edge of the wing, which split, moving the surface both up and down together, thus creating an air brake, which yaws the plane to that side. But obviously, these would impair the aircraft's low radar observability if you're in a hostile airspace. So, they can actually increase power to engines on one side and maintain control that way as well. Now, other than radar detection, stealth works by reducing visible heat from below. As you'll have noticed with this footage, the engine isn't visible from below and in fact it's much higher in the airframe so that they can dissipate the heat before it reaches the aircraft's underside. It's powered by four General Electric turbofans, each producing around 17,300 pounds of thrust. Now obviously these expel a lot of very hot air, and that will be detected, so there's a lot of thought gone into this. Now here we are standing on a ladder and looking at the forward air intake. Firstly, the intake is well back because the turbine blades themselves, in particular, would reflect radar waves. Secondly, just below the main air intake is a lower one. This draws in the boundary layer of air, which is usually turbulent and impairs the engine's performance, but unlike most aircraft which expel it back out into the atmosphere, this cold air moves through the fuselage and is added back into the very hot exhaust gas to try and lower its temperature. 
here we are again behind the engine and you'll notice that the engine outlet is quite a long way forward so it's blowing everything along the top of itself which normally would be very inefficient hence why most aircraft exhaust straight from the rear of the aircraft such as this xb70 but there is a reason Remember that the exhaust needs to be cooled, and it does this by blowing over a carbon fiber reinforced polymer and titanium surface, which you can see here from a different angle and appears darker, and this dissipates the heat and accelerates the cooling. It is not supersonic, nor is there an afterburner, as the massive flame would generate a lot of heat and light. The sonic boom would create a lot of attention, and the whole plane surface would heat up through aerodynamic heating, and therefore increase the infrared signature. There was actually a plan to release chemicals to inhibit the formation of contrails, although that didn't make production and instead they just closely monitor and change altitude if contrails become evident, as a long white line would obviously draw a lot of attention to themselves. Again, the whole underside is really smooth and sorry that the lighting and footage under here isn't great. Next up, let's have a look at the armament. There are two internal bays and officially they can hold 40,000 pounds but it's probably a bit more. Now these doors operate incredibly quickly as you can imagine that when it's open, the aircraft's radar cross section goes through the roof. In fact, it would have been the Bombay doors that gave away the F-117's location when it was shot down in Eastern Europe a few decades ago. So the doors open, the weapon is dropped and they're immediately and automatically closed. Now you can make out the jagged forward end of the doors, as again, the small number of breaks in the surface use these shapes to reduce the radar return as much as possible. Now everything is stored inside, as obviously any external weapons would reflect radar. It could carry dumb bombs or guided bombs, including two 30,000 pound bunker busting bombs, uh, 16 B-61 or B-83 nuclear bombs, and even cruise missiles. Now there are no guns nor air-to-air -air missiles, as the B-2's only defence is not being noticed, but otherwise it's fairly defenceless. The next interesting thing I'll comment on is the landing gear, which itself is pretty standard and is a tricycle layout, as most modern aircraft are. But what's interesting are the massive doors that cover it. Many bigger aircraft have this whole origami of multiple folding doors, but obviously these would create a lot of panel joints on the underside and increase observability. So instead of that, they simply have this one larger door so that there's just one panel ruining things rather than a few smaller separate ones. Now obviously, something this big would be a disaster for the radar cross section, but that's okay as the landing gear door will only ever be open when they're landing or taking off from their own base. And speaking about radar cross section, apparently it's about the same size as a large bird, and obviously any radar operator wouldn't want the shame of sending interceptor jets or missiles to take out a seagull. Now as well as the shape reflecting radar waves, there's also a lot of radar absorbing material, also known as RAM, and this is where the details online get a lot vaguer and I'm sure it's all classified. It may include a carbon graphite composite material and paint that includes iron particles, all of which can absorb radar waves themselves. But what we do know is that these surfaces are incredibly fragile and the aircraft actually stays in a climate and humidity controlled hangar. These surfaces are painstakingly checked after each flight as any damage might destroy its stealthiness. And that explains why maintenance costs are around $3.4 million per month. And speaking about the cost, including the development, in 1997, it was calculated that each aircraft cost $2.13 billion each, which is just mind-blowing. Unfortunately, I couldn't go inside as this is still a very secretive aircraft, although a massive thanks to the National Museum of the USAF in Dayton for letting me film. It's an amazing place and I've got many more videos coming from my visits there. I hope you enjoyed the video. I have many more similar videos on my channel and more coming, so please check them out. Thanks for watching.